good morning, and I can't see any of you, and that's okay. Uh, first, uh, before I get started, I want to thank Dave for giving me the opportunity to come up here and speak again today. And I also want to thank you for being here. For those of you online, glad you're with us this morning. I'm going to start out with a word of prayer, if you pray with me. Father, may the words uh, that I speak this morning be words of encouragement. May they be challenging words. May they even convict when necessary, Lord. But most of all, may they be glorifying to you. I sure do love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. Um, Tomorrow's Monday, getting ready to start a new week. So in just a second, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to read something to you, and I want you to listen to what I say. And then I want, to, I want to see how you react to that, okay? So close your eyes and listen to what I'm getting ready to say. Good Monday morning. Here we are back into our weekly routine after the weekend. And guess what? We've got a snowstorm to track over the next 48 hours. And it's going to bring wintry weather across parts, if not all, of the tri-state area by Wednesday morning. Right now, the National Weather Service has issued a winter storm watch for Wednesday which could be upgraded to a winter storm warning. One of the models we use potentially shows snowfall amounts of up to seven, five to seven inches by Wednesday morning and then up to as much as a foot of snow by the weekend. Okay, open up your eyes. What did you hear? You heard a weather report. Okay, what else did you hear? Snowstorm, okay, okay. Anything, did you hear, catch anything else? It's okay if you didn't. All right, let me ask you this question. If this really happened tomorrow morning, how would you react to that? What would you do? If you thought that much snow was coming in a couple of days, what would you do? What's that? Get prepared. What would you do to get prepared? Buy toilet paper. There you go, right? (laughs) Right? That's happened once before, I think. Uh, What else would you do? Buy groceries. Go to the grocery store, right? What else might you do? Yeah, salt for the sidewalks. Snow shovel, okay. Anybody else? How about this? Anybody think about uh, getting out their snow gear and maybe the possibility of going sledding? Anybody think about that? I see a hand back there, okay. What about gathering some movies up and getting some hot chocolate so you can watch movies while the snow comes down? Anybody think about that? The, the, the reason I'm sharing this with you, there's something I, I want you to know. People react in lots of different ways when they hear stuff like this. But what you need to know is the snow didn't do it. The snow had absolutely nothing to do with your reaction, nothing to do with your rep- preparation. What caused your reaction, what caused your behavior was what you think about the snow. What you think is coming. And what I want to talk about this morning is how you think drives the way you behave. And we're going to talk about why it's important to put certain thoughts in your mind and keep other thoughts out of your mind because it does drive the way you behave. I want to share just a quick personal story with you, and there's a relevance to it, trust me. Um, If you have noticed over the last weeks, whatever, uh, if you see me walking around here, you see me walking with a limp or two limps or whatever, both both legs. Um, this started, so I used to walk a lot, a lot, uh, eight, fifth, sometimes up to 15 miles a day. And about a year ago, my feet started to hurt. And what I put together was, it was about the time that I started to serve in the food pantry here at Catalyst. My feet started to hurt. And I thought it was my shoes. I thought it was a lot of things. But it just, it just wouldn't go away. It just wouldn't go away. Now, this summer, the pain started to increase. And as I thought back, why did the pain increase? When did the pain increase? What caused this? What am I doing? Well, what I was doing was getting ready to speak at Catalyst on July 19th, and my pain went up. It happened again. Getting ready to speak, my pain level went up. Why am I telling you this? A lot of time I spent talking to the Lord about this, trust me, and what he's shown me, this is a, this is a thorn in my flesh. And I don't know, you heard my last message in July. I somewhat feel like Job at times. I lost my family. I lost everything. And Satan couldn't break me. So the next time he said, okay, now I'm coming at you physically. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attack you there. At least that's how I feel. 
and it seems to be consistent with what's happening in my life. So why am I telling you this? Well, about two weeks ago, I was lying in bed, and I just couldn't sleep. My feet were hurting so bad, and I was like, Father, what am I supposed to do? You know I got to sleep. I need some help, and this is what I got back. Aren't you getting ready to speak at Catalyst again? Yeah. Well, what's your topic? What's your message? The battle starts in your mind. It took about two seconds, and I realized, ah, got it. I was fighting a battle in my mind right then and there. And he was reminding me about delivering this message. And it, it, let, me, let me tell you what it says. I, I skipped this part. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9 about Paul and the thorn in his flesh. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. That's how I feel, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, and I have more than three, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. See, this morning as I'm standing up here, God was reminding me, I'm not preaching to you. I'm just talking to you. I'm talking to you as somebody that goes through the exact same things you do. Maybe the thoughts are different. Maybe the struggles are different. But they're still there. The battle is still there. See, and everybody has this battle in their mind. Whether they're a Christ follower or they're not, but so many people don't even realize that they're fighting a battle. They're just kind of going on with their day, and they don't know what to do with all these thoughts. Well, that's what we're going to talk about here this morning. Well, the the first thing I want you to see is, or the first thing we need to know is, um, what is the battle? First off, we've got to know what it is before we can fight it. When did it start, and who exactly are we fighting against? All three of these answers are found in the book of Genesis, chapters 2 and 3. So I'm going to go through a a couple of messages. They'll be on the screen if you want to open up your Bible. That's great. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. That's where we're going to start. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, You shall surely die. Then Genesis chapter 3, the first five verses of chapter 3, says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from any eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, on those two passages, what we find out is the battle is the battle between good and evil. That's what our battle is. And when did it start? It started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. It's been there ever since. And who exactly are we fighting against? We're fighting against Satan. He is our enemy. Let me go to Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. It talks about this battle. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, it speaks of that same thing that was in the Garden of Eden. Then in verse 16, it goes on to say, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Okay, I'm going to go on. We're going to talk about the armor of God here in a moment, but I I need to interject this. This is not the message of the morning, but it is presenting itself so clearly I need to say this. Sometimes we're opposed to people 
And Satan deceives us to think that our enemy is people. Our enemy is not people. Now, Satan uses people, but they are still not our enemies. As Christ followers, what we need to be doing when people, when you all of a sudden think somebody's your enemy, it's easy to talk about politics, I'm not going to, but that's a great example. When we start thinking they're our enemies, we're in opposition to them. That's what an enemy is. It's, it's an opponent. When we start thinking it's them, that Satan is winning. He is absolutely winning. See, here's what a non-believer will think when they, when, when you come out as a believer and say something that they're opposed to, see, they don't think like a believer. But here's, here's what they do think, because what they think is how they act. It says, if that's what it means to be a Christian, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, to be like that, I don't want any part of it. And we've just lost an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody that desperately needs us. So I just want to say, if you think that people are your enemy, I want you to double think that. And, and, and before you do anything else, because they are not our enemy. Okay, let's go back to the armor of God for a second. The armor of God, when you put it on, almost the entire armor is for defensive purposes. It talks about extinguishing the flaming arrows or darts that the enemy throws at you. It protects you. So you can, you can, take, so you can take a beating. There's only one, actually there's two things, but one part of the armor that is offensive, that we fight back with. And that's the word of God. That's the sword of the spirit. And that's what it's talking about here. If, if all we do is take the blows and take the blows, we're going to wear down. It may, not, it may not get us completely into our heart and change us, but it will, it will neutralize us. And we won't be able to go out and do what God has called us to do. We've got to fight back. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning is how we fight back with the word of God against our enemy. Let's go back to Adam and Eve's story real quick. There's two important things we need to look at. One is the serpent, our enemy, is very crafty. See, he had a conversation with Eve, right? He didn't have the conversation with Adam. If we look at that a little bit more closely, God had the conversation with Adam. And it was right before Eve was created. So Eve didn't have the conversation with God. Adam did. And it was Adam's responsibility to pass it along to Eve. We we sometimes can miss that. And here's what Eve's response was. She had parts of what God said, but she didn't have all of it. It was twisted. If you think about how a snake slithers on the ground, he twists back and forth. That is not a mistake that a snake twists because that's what Satan does. He twists things. And it may be ever so slightly, but, but here's what he did. Have you ever played the telephone game? Anybody know, does anybody even know what that is? Okay, well, if, if you don't know what that is, it's when you whisper something in somebody's ear, and then they take that message, and they tell the next person, and then however many people it goes around to it gets to the end, and that next person, or the last person, says what they heard. Is it hardly ever the same? It's, it gets twisted as we go around, as we talk. See, that's what happens. See, what we don't know with Adam and Eve is, did Adam not listen to God clearly? So when he relayed the message to Eve, she couldn't get it right because he didn't have it right. Or did Adam have it right and Eve didn't hear it correctly? What well, We don't know and it doesn't matter, but the fact is it got twisted. So what can we learn from that? Here's what we learned from it. They didn't have the written word of God, but they had the spoken word of God. And if we kind of know what God says, if we just kind of know what God says, that's where sin can creep in and take over because we don't really know what God said. Because see, Eve, she kind of knew, but she didn't really know, and she got deceived. And that same thing will happen to us if we just kind of know. Here's what it says in James. This is not on your screen. First chapter, verses 14 and 15. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after his desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. That's exactly what happened with with Eve, and that's exactly what happens today. People get enticed. They don't know God's word, and it gets twisted. It sounds good. It sounds right, but it's not. And the enemy just 
That's where he goes. He's got a crack. He, crack. He's going to get in there. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look back at this story a little bit more with some hindsight, with 20-20 vision. And we're going to, we need to know this. We fight the battle how? What, what do we fight the battle with? The sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word, right? And Scripture can help us avoid sin. That's a message for another day. We're going to talk about sin, but we're not going to talk about avoiding sin. We're going to talk about how to deal with our sin. Because i got a spoiler alert for you right now. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. See, we can, we can start feeling really good about ourselves and go, oh, I'm good, I'm not, I don't have any sin in my life, and, the, and the, this is the truth. This is what God says. If you say you don't have any sin, you're being deceived. You're being deceived. And nobody wants to go looking for it, but if we want to get closer to God, if we want to be more like God, if we want to represent God, we need to be asking him, what is it in my life that needs to be rooted out of here? We need to get it out of here. So if you think you don't have any sin, I want you to stop and, and probably need to memorize this verse. So how did Adam and Eve respond to their sin? There are three things that they did or that we're going to talk about here this morning, and it's the same thing that we do today, same thing people do today. Let's go back to Genesis real quick, and I'll go through that, and I'll point it out. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. See, the first thing that we do when we sin is we hide that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. They hide. This is actually the first recorded game of hide-and-seek that ever was. We go hide, God comes and seeks us. That's where it came from, if you're wondering. But why do we, why do we hide when we sin? I'm going to suggest a few things this morning, and there may be more, but see if you can relate to any of this. One of the reasons we hide is because we don't think we're going to get caught. It's pretty straightforward. We think oh, nobody else will ever know. They'll never find that out. Or we don't want to be embarrassed or feel ashamed, so we keep quiet. Maybe there's somebody that we're, we feel like we're going to let them down if they find out what really is going on inside of us, so we're just going to keep it to ourselves because I don't want to go, I don't want to have that shame. Or maybe you're doing it to protect your reputation. Maybe you've got some position in a firm, or maybe you've got some standing in the church, or whatever it might be that you feel like, oh my gosh, if somebody finds out about this, it'll ruin me, so I can't let anybody know. Or maybe we think we can change on our own. Since we know that we have the power to stop at any time we want to, why bring anybody else into it? I'll just take care of it myself. So I won't, I won't say anything. Well, we all know those are lies. So what does God say about it? What does Scripture say about it? And I'm uh, sure there's more, but here's three. First one is in Luke chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who may enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. See, our sin is eventually going to come to light at some point or, or another. In Jeremiah, it says this, chapter 16, verse 17, For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. Foolish to try to hide from God. Hebrews 4.13, this is maybe even the, the closest to what happened in the garden. And, the, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed. That's kind of the language they used. To the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. At some point or another, 
we're going to face this when we try to hide. What, what are we going to believe? Because if we believe we can hide and we believe nobody's going to find out our behavior, that's the way we're going to go. We're going to keep hiding it. If we believe what God says, we'd be foolish to not repent. Is that not true? So what you believe matters. What God says matters. And at some point, you're going to have to give an account to God. So you might as well do it now. Get it out of here. Yes, it might hurt a little bit. But better now than later. It's foolishness. Okay, second thing that we do is we become afraid, which is what Adam said. I was afraid, so I hid. See, what are we afraid of? Well, we may be afraid of the consequences. See, I heard of a guy not too long ago. I don't know him. Just I, I heard a con- in a conversation that his, this guy liked to go drinking. And the issue with him was he never got sick. He never had a hangover. He never had any consequences, so his behavior continued because he didn't think there was anything wrong with it. It's a big deal. What's the big deal? But there are consequences. And see, the thing is, without consequences, our behavior is not likely to change. It's just not likely to change. That, that's called discipline from God, and that means he wants to teach us. So, yeah, we, when we sin, God still wants to teach us through that. Now, maybe we think that God is getting ready to smack us over the head with a sledgehammer. I don't know if any of you ever felt that way or not. That is not true. It's absolutely not true. It is important that we need to fear the Lord, and Scripture says that, but it needs to be a healthy fear, reverence, respect, that kind of fear, not a fear of God is going to smack us with a sledgehammer. See, fools despise God's wisdom, and they despise God's instruction because they don't want consequences. They want to go on and live the way they want to live without any kind of fear of anything happening to them. Here's what Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's when you start to get it, when you start to have that respect and reverence for God. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. What fools don't understand is the consequences are going to come. One way or another, they're going to come. And for those that don't know Jesus, the, the biggest consequence is going to be separation from God forever. That's the biggest one, and they don't, they don't get it. Now, see, I know of another guy that drank a lot when he was younger as well. Uh, He had a really, really stressful job. He was a state cop, and he saw a lot of bad stuff, saw some murders and all kinds of things, things that have a hard time getting out of your head. So he wasn't a believer. So in order to deal with that, he turned to alcohol. It It was an escape. And he ended up, he liked alcohol, He liked it a lot, and he drank a lot. Didn't think about the consequences. He just didn't want to deal with what he was was facing in his job. So he was trying to escape. What happened was, a little bit later in life, his health started to fail. And he started to become more aware of his mortality. And he started asking questions about, what is it? What happens when this body completely shuts down? And he knew what he did... Looking back, he goes, I did this to myself. I did it to myself. But he didn't know how to get out of it. His belief system was like the good meter that we watched before. If I do enough good things, maybe I'll, just, I'll be able to, to get in. Maybe the scoreboard will be over in my favor. See, here's the thing about God, though. When we sin, God doesn't not love us when we sin. That's, that is a lie as well. Look what Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says about us and sin. But God showed his love for us, and then while we were still sinners, he died for us. He is not waiting for us to clean our life up. He's waiting for us to come to him and repent and let him clean it up because we can't do it on our own. It's foolishness like we talked about before. See, even in sin, but I would say especially in sin, we need to remember how God views us. There's no reason to hide from God. He wants us to repent and restore us, and he wants to show us a better way. Our way is not working. He wants to show us a better way, so when consequences come our way, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to teach us. Well, in June of 2017, God actually connected me with this guy, this state policeman that was lost, and we met in the lobby of McDonald's. See, God never stopped loving him, and he used me to introduce him to Jesus. And he's changed forever, still dealing with the consequences of the past behavior, 
But now he knows the truth about how much God loves him. Even though he struggles with his health, he knows where his eternal destination is. Is that right, Mike? That's Mike right there. That's the guy right here this morning. It's been awesome to be able to get to know him. And thank you for letting me use your story, too. The third thing that we do is just what Adam did. Well, it was the woman. You blame somebody else. You want to shift it. It's called the blame game. I call it clouding the issue. Is you want to make things so cloudy and you're shifting the blame onto somebody else or something else so you don't have to take responsibility for it. See, that's what Adam tried to do. But how foolish is it to think that God doesn't know? How foolish is it to think that we can trick him? See, even when we sin, God still pursues us. That's what it says in Isaiah, and I'm going to show you here in a second. So we want to, we want to blame somebody else or we want to take responsibility. Here's what God says, Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he, might be, well, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so were my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, people sometimes can get angry at God because he allowed certain things to happen in their life, and, and they're, they're misunderstanding the compassion and the love that God has for them. And he allows things to happen in your life because he's trying to get your attention. Here's what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God already knew what you were going to do before you ever did it anyway. He knew you were going to sin before you were ever born. Why do we play around with sin? It's fool- it is absolute foolishness. Given what God, word, what God says in his word about how he looks at us and about how he views sin, why would we not deal with it when it comes into our lives? Don't believe the lies of the enemy. See, that's the battle we're talking about. What are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the lies? Are you going to believe all this stuff that is not true? Or are you going to believe what God says who will cleanse you and purify you? And then you can move on and learn from what you just went through. Discipline means to teach. God is continuing to try to teach us, always trying to teach us. The question is, are we going to listen and are we going to try to learn or not? Let me give you three action steps, if you will, uh, that will help you with this battle in your mind. The first one is, when a situation comes up, and I'll, I'll give you an example here, you want to respond to something instead of react to something. You know the difference between responding and reacting. Reacting is when it happens, you just, you just go. You don't think, you just, you just go and take care or deal with whatever it is that's in front of you. Responding is to take a step back, maybe say a quick prayer if you, if you think about that, or at least think about the ramifications of how you're going to move forward, what might happen if you react instead of taking a break. A lot of times this happens in parenting. So if you've got kids, or if you've had kids in the past, this, this may uh, come clear to you. Consider that you had a nice, really nice vase that you loved to have. It was, in, it was in a part of the house, and you come into the room and find out that that vase is shattered on the ground, and you're just like, oh, my gosh. Your, your first reaction might be to get angry. What in the world happened? Then when you find out that it was one of your kids that threw something and knocked it over and busted it, then your reaction is to get mad, to get angry, to yell at them, tell them to get in their room, and what you're doing is you're just multiplying the problem because the vase is gone. It's busted. When you react to that, now you've got a broken relationship because what will happen is if you react so strongly that it brings fear, remember what it said, we, we get scared of God if it brings fear, or maybe the next time that they do something wrong, because of that reaction, now they're going to hide from you. They're not going to tell you the truth. Because they don't want to have to deal with what's coming. Response, on the other way, is to take a step back, to take a deep breath. It doesn't mean that you don't get angry. It means you control that anger. 
It means you wait to go talk to your child until you're ready to know how you can teach them because God wants to teach us. See, God doesn't want to beat us over the head with a sledgehammer, but it's so quick sometimes we want to do that to somebody else. That's not how God wants us to react. Actually, he doesn't want us to react. He wants us to respond. Here's what it says in James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. You want to respond to things. You don't want to react to things. The second thing to help you with this battle is you want to memorize God's word. So your brain can't focus on two things at the same time. If you're focusing on God's word and what God says, you can't focus on anything else. You can't, Satan can't get a foothold in there if you're focusing on what God is saying. Because you can't hear those lies. There it is. But see, when we're in the midst of a struggle, we don't think very clearly. So we want to try to do this stuff in preparation before something happens, not at the moment that it does happen because it's a lot more difficult to deal with it when that takes place. It doesn't always work that way. But you pretty much know, if you if you're any, have any self-awareness at all, you pretty much know some areas of weakness that you have. So what you want to do is you want to go to Scripture and you want to find some verses that, where God addresses what that weakness is. And then you want to write, the, just like these things I've been showing, write these Scriptures down and then read them out loud. I used to put them on index cards. Write, write it down, read it out loud, and I would go over it and over it and over it and over it. And now, not that I got it all together, but I am a lot quicker when something comes out, I'm a lot quicker to be able to respond to things instead of react because I know I've been over it. This is how I'm supposed to do it. And the more you practice it, the better you're going to get. Let me give you an example. Without having to go into what gossip is, we all know what gossip is. And it's not something that is pleasing to the Lord. So when, if, if you know that is a struggle that you have, here's three scripture verses I would challenge you to write down. And then go over them and over them and over them. And then the next time that gossip, when, when the opportunity for gossip is there, these scriptures pop into your head and it gives you an opportunity to fight. You've got to fight back. If you just sit back passively, the enemy is going to, he's going to wail you. He's too strong. Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs eleven twelve. 12. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. And here's the, really the biggie. Matthew 12, 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. See, that, that's a showstopper for me. If I've I got to remember, if i got to sit and give account to God for what I just got done saying, maybe I need to close my mouth. That's just an example. Find out what, I mean, you don't have to find out. Figure out what it is that you struggle with and then see what God says about it and then start fighting that battle now. Start fighting it now. See, uh, the third thing, and this is, this is a big one too, is we need to forgive ourselves when we blow it, when we sin. See, God already knew what was going to take place anyway. That doesn't mean that you're flippant with it and go, oh, it ain't no big deal. It's a big deal, but you need to forgive yourself. Because if you don't, your mind can go into despair, and it can, it can go into a downward spiral, and, you can't, and then you're going to really have trouble getting out of it. How about this? John, 1 John chapter 1, 9, I think we already went through this. You confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God is... All you got to do is confess it, and God will forgive. So what's the deal about us not forgiving ourselves? You know what we're saying when we don't forgive ourselves? God, I have a higher standard than you do. Boy, I know you'll forgive me for anything, but I sure won't. That's really what you're saying. I have a, I have a higher standard than God. Do you really? Do you really believe that? I hope not. I sure hope not. Use your experiences, learn from them, and adjust. Again, I can't say this enough, teaching. God is trying to teach us. Learn from him. Let him teach you. Okay, here's, here's the bottom line. What do you believe? 
If you say that you're a Christ follower, if you follow Jesus, then your behavior should reflect that. Because how we think is how we behave. If you say that you're a Christ follower and your behavior does not reflect that, you got to be honest. You can't fool God. Be honest. If it doesn't, then I implore you to reevaluate what you believe. Based on what we just went through, I really ask you to reevaluate that. See, Jesus is going to come back soon, and you're going to have to give an account. You're going to have to stand before him. Deal with it now. Don't wait until then. Don't wait until then. See, the, the good meter is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus is the only, he is the only way. So here's what I want to leave you with this morning. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the sin, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Let me give you a picture. If you, there's a reason that he talks about east and west, east and west instead of north and south. See, if you if you started right here and you start walking north and you just keep going north, 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 you're eventually going to hit the North Pole. Then what's the next step you take? Is the next step you take north? It's south. That's right. You've reached a destination. You've reached a point. Now you're going to go in another direction. Same thing if you go south, you're going to reach a point. But see, God's forgiveness doesn't reach a point. If you start going east and you go east, you will never reach west. You'll never reach it. If you start going west, you're never going to reach east. God's love and God's forgiveness is infinite. It never ends. It just keeps going and going. See, it's not finite like north and south. It's infinite like east and west. That is not a mistake of why he says it this way. Now, this is the last point right here. On the cross, Jesus stretched out his arms with his hands pointing east and west. And he was saying to you, this is how much I love you. Do you believe it? Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for your infinite love. Thank you for the cross and what that means for us not only today but for eternity. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that your words would reach those that needed to reach. Lord, I pray it would be an encouragement. Um, convicting if necessary, but whatever, Lord. Um, I just pray that it was glorifying to you. We love you and lift this thing, everything up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
He has done great things, lifted up, he defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in his name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able. God is with us, he will go before, he will never leave us, he will never leave us, God is for us, he has open arms, he will never fail us, he will never fail us, lifted up, he defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in his name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able, lifted up, he defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in his name we overcome. For the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God is able. Oh, my mic's on. There you go. So glad you're here this morning. I hope that you all have a great week and no snow. Trust me, there won't be any snow. All right, one more thing. Don't go anywhere. Baptism people, go in line on the way out so people can say goodbye to you. I'm going to make a... Oh, Greg, grab me that gallon of tea right there. We have probably 10 gallons, maybe more, of freshly brewed sweet tea that we have to get rid of at $5 a piece. So if you're interested in grabbing, this is cheaper than McAllister's itself, but it is McAllister's tea. If you're interested in buying the tea, it's $5 on the Sherpa pole stage. If you do not know what that is, this used to be an old bar. We call it Sherpa pole stage because that's what it used to be. All right, so $5 on the way out. Baptism people, head on out. I'm waiting. Bap- well, just don't go anywhere. Let the baptism people line up. All right, first come, first serve, $5, sweet, unsweet tea. Sound like Thank you, Greg. Let's give Greg a hand. Thank you, Mr. Greg. You're awesome. All right, baptism people, head out. Make a line on the way out. I'm holding, I'm holding them up for you. Go. Go, people. All right, Layla, go that way. Through the door. That way, through the door, where, where I shake people's hands. There you go. All right, done. All right, have a great week. Oh, next week we're going to enter the throne room of heaven. All right, we're going to see what that looks like. Have a great week. Say goodbye. to Congratulations to the baptism people. All right.